So there are a lot of reasons why a young man buys a hot rod that's sure to almost kill him. My mother married young, and both my parents were the products of angry fathers and broken homes. They divorced a few years after I was born, and soon after my mother met my stepfather, also the product of an angry father and a broken home. So I had one military tough guy stepfather <laughs> who wanted me to be like him and not some sensitive, scrawny bookworm, and my biological father who eventually rendered himself invisible. Two fathers who grappled with the image of their son because they grappled with the image of themselves. Two fathers too often consumed by their own sense of reckless abandon and their efforts to not think of their own reckless fathers. And my mother trying her best to build a proper family. <coughs> the last time I saw my biological father until I was 18 was when I was five and he handed over the title and keys to that 65 Mustang in order to make up for back child support stripping his identity as a driver and a father at that moment. I had a childhood filled with moving around a bit with my stepfather in the military, of a lot of books and TV and movies of Back to the Future and Knight Rider and Dukes of Hazard. There was a jump every episode. It was fucking sick. <laughs> of obsessing over owning a Lamborghini one day. Hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> at some point when I was nine or 10, my stepfather and I would have a rare moment of connection when he showed me the emergency brake skid trick in, your, in our little 85 Datsun while we waited for my mother in a rain slicked parking lot as she was working at Target, hit a little gas, turn the wheel, pull the e-brake, flip the car around in a 180. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> so when I was 15, I would trade lessons in that stunt for real lessons in driving. My friends showing me how to move steadily in a straight line when my impulse was to drive fast and skid around corners. When I was finally allowed to drive, I'd take my mom's little car around the military base we lived on in Japan, racing the car in a straightaway parallel to the base's runway, thinking of myself as some sort of Mad Max figure. And naturally, when I was 18, I bought a 69 Chevy that almost killed me. I'd spent those previous three years in high school envisioning myself as a writer, a musician, a filmmaker, and the owner of a muscle car. I thought I'd be Kafka and Tarantino and Cobain and McQueen all in one. <laughs> yeah, I was fucking dumb, it's true. <laughs> but more than anything, I wanted autonomy. Big, loud, roaring autonomy. A newfound independence, a new skin. Albeit barely functional, chip paint, rusted from within. A broken muffler spewing carbon dioxide into the vehicles I drove. And so it happened on my 18th birthday after living alone in my first apartment in the heart of El Cajon for a week, that I'd head to the DMV and just barely pass my driver's test. <laughs> I'd respond to an ad in the classifieds that day for a muscle car for sale, that 69 Chevy Nova. And it was made clear that the car needed some work. The engine needed a new carburetor. My gearhead buddies said they'd be able to get it going pretty quickly, but they also just told me not to buy it. <laughs> but I, I couldn't wait any longer, and I plunked over $1,000, it was half the money I'd saved up from high school jobs. And 20 minutes later, on the way to the auto parts store, auto parts store I got in my first wreck with that piece of shit. <laughs> the pump brake's not engaging as I approach the stop sign, me rearing a new Corvette. My car's front end bent into a grimace, barely noticeable frame damage on the other. The Nova wasn't drivable, its radiator busted. My father I hadn't seen in 13 years. We'd reconnected pretty recently at this point. And he's a mechanic by trade. Cars basically being the only thing he's ever really understood. This was the second or third time we'd hung out, and for the first time, he had something to really offer. He could put himself to use. We'd hit the junkyard to find a replacement radiator. My mother came out to loan me money for other repairs. There was an awkward state, excuse me, awkward exchange between them. Seen each other for the first time in almost 15 years since she'd left him. This ghost of a man was in the flesh again, trying to repair the damage to my car the damage to my mother, the damage to me. And after that Nova was running, I'd spend a few months driving all over San Diego, giving people rides from gas, going to shows, or rides from class, excuse me, going to shows, racing people in the middle of the night in the quiet streets of East County. <laughs> I won. <laughs> I was exploring the world via my car, kind of like Travis Bickle and Taxi Driver, or uh, the driver, you know, Ryan Gosling and Drive but way less sociopathic than either of them. 
My 69 Chevy Nova was a symbol that I was a man, a man with a tough as shit car, <laughs> that I was independent. I could go wherever and do whatever I wanted, that my small vulnerable, vulnerable self was encased within a hulking beast, that I was protected. But that hot rod was pretty vulnerable too. It's wiring faulty, it's radio busted, the lock's finicky. This hot rod hadn't been, hadn't been properly cared for. So around Christmas time, I happened to be the only male at a job working with a group of nice, cute girls my age. My bosses had a dinner arranged, and it felt huge. My first get-together as an adult, showing up and showing off in my motherfucking hot rod. <laughs> I left work that evening, driving towards Seaport Village, and it was a few, mi few miles down the freeway where the 125 South and 94 meet in the middle lane of rush hour traffic. There was an accident on the other side of the freeway, Traffic stopped in the dark, a row of headlights going nowhere. Hope it's not too bad, I thought. And then something rattled in my engine. And I thought I'd have time to pull off the freeway, but then the car just turned off and stopped entirely. It was busy enough that traffic wasn't flowing too quickly and cars were moving around me. But it was enough that I knew if I did the wrong thing, somebody was going to get hurt. It was a heavy Chevy, so the idea of trying to push it through moving traffic wasn't an option. The thought of running through moving traffic to get to the call box crossed my mind, but I imagined watching somebody hit the car if I even made it across three lanes of busy traffic myself. So the only option that seemed reasonable at that time <laughs> was for me to fix it myself in the dark, in the middle of six lanes, in the middle of rush hour traffic even though I didn't actually know anything about how to fix an engine. <laughs> you just screw the thing back on, right? <clears throat> so as I'd learned to do before, I took on this weird con. I'd been in other instances in high school that seemed like certain death, and I'd had friends and family die in a pretty short succession of time. And every time I just sort of submitted and thought, this just is. So I turned my hazards on and lit a cigarette, and I waited a few minutes to make sure the cars could see mine and were making their way around it. And When it felt safe enough, I very calmly got out of my car and in front of it, opening my hood, leaning in, trying to make it out in the dark. And what I remember next is opening my eyes and being lifted into an ambulance, looking at the paramedics. What happened, I asked through a bloody mouth. Uh, Sir, you were in an accident. Please stay calm. Oh, how bad is it? It's pretty bad, sir. <laughs> Please stop talking and relax. Uh, is it going to take that long? I'm on my way to a Christmas party with all the cute girls I work with. <laughs> You're not going to make it to that party. I saw the paramedics look at one another wide-eyed, and one of them pushed a syringe running up into my arm. I woke up again being wheeled through a hospital, pinned down to a gurney that stopped outside of a room. The nurses left to gather some things, and for a couple minutes, I was alone in almost complete silence. No real idea of how severe everything was. I looked down and saw blood on my t-shirt from the skate shop I used to hang out in, in Japan, and I thought, oh, that sucks. I love this shirt. <laughs> so the nurses returned with their nurse stuff, and I, I couldn't seem to shut up. <laughs> Uh, so what now, I asked. We have a surgeon on the way, sir. Please stay calm. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so my wallet's in my back pants pocket. Uh, there's a list of phone numbers. Uh, these are my parents. These are my roommates. These are my bosses. If you can please call them and just tell them where I am. Uh, my insurance card's in there, too. I saw that wide-eyed look again. <laughs> but they did as I asked. <laughs> So one of the nurses and brought, a, brought out a pair of scissors to the feet of my pants and started cutting upwards. And I remember being embarrassed at first, a young female nurse seeing me, me, seeing me in my underwear. But then I figured she probably sees young idiot men in their underwear strapped to gurneys all the time. <laughs> so I woke up again to my parents, my bosses, my roommates at my hospital door, a sea of white eyes and gasping mouths. I waved and tried to smile. Between the shock and the morphine, I didn't understand what the big deal was. I woke again in the morning to my mother, who told me that we'd had a surgeon out pretty swiftly in the night to stitch me up, that I'd be able to leave that morning. 
I asked if I could see how I looked, and even though she told me I probably shouldn't, I insisted. And the nurse wheeled me into the bathroom and helped me stand in front of the mirror. It wasn't that bad, I thought. I mean, I wasn't missing an eye or anything. I mean, I was missing some teeth. My face was stitched up pretty severely, and honestly, I didn't know what to feel exactly. Like a strange sense of pride, like I'd earned it, or like I owned it, or I don't know, like I'd been in a fight and walked away. So according to the police report, my car had been hit from behind by another car traveling about 35 to 45 miles an hour while I was hunkered down in the engine. I went into the engine and back out, my car traveling roughly 20 feet. The paramedics found me sticking out from underneath the two left wheels. So my face was cut up from colliding with the engine. My knees were almost broken from my front bumper. But somehow, even though I ended up underneath my own car, there weren't any big signs that I'd been dragged on the road or that a wheel had gone over me. And that accident on the other side of the freeway, there was a guy stuck in it who saw the whole thing and called 911. If it wasn't for somebody else crashing their own car, I might not have been saved. So I'd spend the next few weeks living with my family again after trying so hard to get out months earlier. We went to the junkyard to see if there was anything in my car I needed or if anything was salvageable. <coughs> when we lifted the hood, we saw the giant air filter on top bent in on one side, the long screw holding it in also bent down. I did that with my face, I said, and I smiled. <laughs> my parents looked at each other like I was fucking insane. So once I was capable, I was back living in my own apartment, dropping out of college because I couldn't pay attention, self-conscious because of my stitches and then my scars, my fucked up teeth. I actually had dentures for two years. Try waiting tables with that when they fall out. <laughs> and you're trying to flirt with a girl. Doesn't work. Every illusion that I'd had about what my life would have been like at that, po that, that point literally came to a grinding halt. I'd spend the next few years aimless, taking writing classes, eventually writing a short story and then later a screenplay about street racing and fatalism. I'd put those real life hot rod dreams to rest and develop an obsession for car movies. So the other story is the 19 years since then and coping mechanisms and avoidance mechanisms and all the things you do to not think until you have to think. I tell you about how my father basically didn't do anything after my parents split up. He'd be stay, stay the exact same person. I tell you about my stepfather who ran away from shit by going to war four times and doing 30 years in the military. My mother who ran away from her family and actually did pretty well with us. So my fathers and I, we've all been collectively sorting through the anger we've held on to and the mistakes we've made and try to find some peace and forward motion with our past and present and future selves. <clears throat> I know Neil Young famously saying, it's better to burn out than to fade away. It's better to burn out than it is to rest. But I'm hoping that those aren't the only options. Thanks. <laughs>